No, we were we were usually at least a um, hundred to two hundred yards away from it. We we weren't that close to whoever's calling it in, forward observer calling that stuff in. It's, uh, they're, they're, they're pretty sure that we, we wouldn't get hit by it. Occasionally it would happen, but it wasn't because of accuracy, because of not all rounds go where they're supposed to go. All right, everyone, we're back again, and I have the honor of talking to Charlie Kilbrew, a Korean War vet who's got some lot of stories coming on. I met him in Galveston at a sailing event. Charlie, thanks for coming on. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So as I like to do with all of these podcasts, I like to start at the beginning. Um, like I said, you were a Korean War vet. I, you were, were you born and raised in Texas? Born and raised here in Galveston. Oh, okay. So I'm guessing, I don't remember your exact age, but you were born well before World War II started, right? Yes, I was about two years too young to be in World War II. Okay, wow. So how was it growing up back in the 30s and early 40s in Galveston? It was wonderful. It was, it was a great place, probably the, one of the greatest places in the world to grow up. For one so thing, we had uh, legalized, oh, well, illegalized gambling, when, which made our life real interesting. Now, <clears throat> that was formal gambling, but you could always have your street card games, right? Oh, no, no, this was, uh, it was organized. You know, the, um, the people who ran the gambling here were, were good, and they, uh, we had no unemployment in Galveston because of them. Oh, wow. Wow. Yeah. It was, it, it was very good. So growing up there, um, was Galveston a military town back then? Yes, we had, uh, we had an army base here at uh, Fort Crockett. And we, uh, during the war, we housed uh, German prisoners here. Oh, did you? Yeah. And so it's, it's as kids, we could go by and talk to them and and uh, bring them chewing gum or candy or something. Oh wow! And that make must, friends. And they made that, them feel it. That must have been a very unique experience. Yeah, because you know they were uh, they were the enemies, but they weren't bad guys because you know, they probably were just drafted, just like our guys were to right. go in. Them. They just, I don't think they volunteered to go kill people. No, I, <clears throat> probably not. So I'm just curious. Um, you lived through Pearl Harbor in a day and age when, unlike now, where we have the internet and we know immediately what's going on around the world. Um, do you remember Pearl Harbor as a child? Yes, yes. It was... Um, According to our president, it was a day that would live in infamy. Did it make an impact on you personally as a as a young guy? Um, well, the only reason it became personal because I had uh, uh, three brothers that went into the service. Oh wow! Air Force, Air Force, uh, Army, and Marine Corps. So, growing up during the war. Um, did that shape your interest in wanting to go be in the service after you turned 18? Yes. Uh, I really, uh, I was proud of what my brothers did and they were all fortunate and uh, only one of them got wounded. Um, Air Force, his plane crashed, but he lived through it. Uh, I was proud that they all did a good job and came home and Raised families, lived through it. So as you were um, growing up, you said you were able to interact with some of the German POWs. Did you yeah. bond with any of them? Did they stay in the when one place the entire time, or did they get moved around a lot to different POW uh, camps? I have, I have no idea if they. I think they they probably were liberated when the war was over. I don't think they went any place other than Galveston. Oh. To our 
such. We didn't. We would. We wouldn't have knowledge of that. So as you grew up, um, what were those? What were those days like during during the war, going to school, for you? Um, we had um, we had blackouts at night because there were subs offshore that we knew about because we had a blimp base that was uh, further inland at Hitchcock, Texas. And the blimps would go out at the daytime and they could spot submarines out there. Oh, wow. Uh, okay. See, I, I don't think a lot of people nowadays realize that there was actually a, at least a shipping threat to the United States during World War II. I, I grew up on the West Coast and my grandma and my mom, my mom was born in 41. And um, my grandma remembers all the stuff that happened in the LA area and in the uh, Orange County area with the blackouts as well. We, my, I remember my father was a, a block warden and it was his job to go around and make sure everybody had their lights out or curtains drawn. And, but it was kind of like, uh, kind of like playing a game that you, so we never did, we never did get bombed or shelled or anything. No. So with, um, going to school back then, what was that like? Did they, was the war talked about or was it just typical well, school? Yes. Yes, we would have uh, bond drives and um, they'd have uh, drives where they would uh, uh, get cans and everything. So they, you know, pick up scrap, scrap metal. And we remember the food rationing, especially meats, gas rationing. But of course, we were, I was too young to drive. I didn't care about gas ration. It didn't bother me. <laughs> uh, you, you weren't driving at a young age of 13, 14, Charlie? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> so they do nowadays. So with Galveston as a whole, did the community seem to change much um, in those days or did life kind of go on? I mean, I know Galveston from Sea Star Base and sailing and the yeah. beaches everyone goes to did everything like that pretty much stay the same everybody just went along with their regular life uh school wasn't interrupted we went you know regular times um people would still come down here from houston and mainland to go on vacations so yeah, now, you, oh go ahead but it was like the war didn't really interfere with us the only thing we were con really concerned about that could, we could be a target because of the refineries at uh, Texas City. Oh, okay. That that makes a lot of sense. I do remember that about Galveston. There's a, a not necessarily Galveston Island, but the rest of the area has a lot of refineries. And, and also being a port city. Uh, yeah. But the only um, the only thing I think was stationed here was Coast Guard. Oh, okay. So, so I don't now any Navy ships except visiting occasionally. Oh, okay. So now um 1945 comes around, we get victory in Europe Day, followed up by the atomic bomb in, in Japan. Were you, was it when everyone came home, what was that like? I seeing all these war vets come home uh from a truly devastating war yeah that was a real war yeah it wasn't like uh, korea or vietnam where it was just a, a political war just to put a put up thing just for manufacturers to make money right so what was it like seeing your brothers coming back when they finally came home oh it was good it was, it, we were so glad to see them that they made it um Listening to my brother Fred that uh, stayed here in Galveston. Uh, the other ones lived in Dallas. So I got to see I got to see my brother who was in the Marine Corps. It was um, and he and he went to work for the people who ran 
the gambling in Galveston. So he had a good job. Oh, good, good. So he came home and was set up probably really quick then. Right. So now in the inner the inner war period, how old were you when World War II ended? Uh, it ended in forty five, so I was fourteen. So, uh, unlike today, where you see recruiting posters and recruiting advertisements all the time on television, the internet, and so forth, um, was the military a thing, a choice for you to start looking at um, after the war? Yes, I uh, joined the reserves. That's how it happened to be called up in the first place when they uh, they reinstated the first Marine Divi- first Marine Regiment. Um, it was all it was all reserves that were called up. Um, oh, okay. A, a lot of a lot of us, a lot of my friends joined the reserves. And uh, uh, there's a few of them, well, maybe a couple of them still left, but uh, they're still alive. But we all went in together, and then uh, we were joined by a lot of uh, Houston and some of the cities close to Galveston. We all went to, uh, well, went out on the train out to uh, San Diego to boot camp together. So, we, and it, as it turns out, uh, we were all reserves. So we, we didn't have any uh, veterans fighters. <laughs> we were all civilians one day, and then we three months later we were seasoned the Marines. So what? So when you joined back then as a reservist, what was the process? Did you go to a recruiter? Did they have um, what we now call MEPS, where they gave you a medical screening before you came in? I don't recall having any anything like that. I don't think uh, where most of my buddies were, we were all working in the same place. And we worked for American National Insurance Company. Most of my work there was just part-time summers and after school but um, there was a guy there that was in the who was a major in the marine corps and he was in charge of uh, one of the departments there and he signed everybody up (laughs) (laughs) we we all we all went off to uh, summer camp (laughs) so did you go to um back then was the reserves did you go through a full uh what is it eight 12 week boot camp in uh, to eight, become a yeah. marine i think i think it, um, as much as i recall it was probably six weeks oh, okay it may have been it may have been more of, but um, it was at least six weeks so and how was went to uh, camp pendleton in california for okay. advanced training actually so, the hindsight the boot camp was just to get you in shape and yeah <laughs> follow order without asking questions so how was that um that time in boot camp for you coming from galveston um going to san diego do you show up at well, mcrd it was for me it was it was pretty easy uh, i'd gone to catholic schools all my life and the, the school i went to was all boys high school and there was a, a, a lot of discipline and the Christian brothers taught it and you got out of line there. And they, at that time they were able to just physically abuse you. They couldn't get away with it today, but they did then. Oh wow! And so you, you got the discipline built in. So having somebody tell you what to do, you were used to it. And then we were all, we all stayed in real good shape and playing football and baseball and basketball. So being in boot camp was kind of easy compared to life at Kerwin High School. Oh yeah. So did you did your do you remember were your drill instructors uh, World War II vets or were they actually um, with the exception of one they were they were reservists. 
I remember one of them, <clears throat> excuse me, I remember one of them got hoarse from hollering at us <laughs> because he, he hadn't been used to hollering at people. <laughs> The other DI, the other DI that I remember was was probably full time. He didn't have any problem. Oh, okay. So you you do the boot camp. Um, it's it's I take it it's not a big culture shock to you, the the getting ordered around or any of that. Yeah, so I think some people had some problem with it. A um, little bit of rebellion, but not much. It, 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 that was in short order. They got slapped down. And if, if I if I'm if I'm kind of taking the right idea from what you're saying by slap down, you mean um, back then they were allowed to be a lot more physical than they are now. Yes, they. Yeah. So was you, there a? Oh, go ahead. You challenge somebody, and and you got taken up on it immediately. Oh, no wow. foolish. Yeah. So did you, um, how were you physically back then, like physical fitness wise? Was any of the stuff that they had you guys do back then challenging to you? No, it was, um, uh, it was a few things that were kind of hard, like uh, walking crab-like with your, you know, walking with just uh, walking with, with your knees completely bent, with your butt almost on the ground. That's kind of hard to do, but. Um, most of the physical activities were, were pretty easy. Oh, good. So yeah. then, then you graduate, you become a Marine. How did that feel when they finally treated you like a fellow Marine? Um, I didn't see any difference <laughs> when we went from boot camp to you know, advanced training. It wasn't that much difference. So now did you become an infantryman? Yes, everybody is in the Marine Corps. Now, I mean, by you, you branch out into different things, but uh, actually, I was uh, my MOS was a mortarman, but I never did, I never did fire mortar in Korea. Oh, okay, so you, so you were, um, you were a grunt who was a mortarman then, rifleman. Yeah. yeah. So now. Um, after the end of your advanced training, did you go back to Galveston or did they just, did Korea break out and you guys went? No, we, we didn't go. I didn't go back to Galveston. So when did you guys learn that Korea kicked off? Well, we left uh, sometime in June, it was June, may have been July, somewhere around there. So we, uh, we left, got on, went on a ship. I don't remember the name of it, but it was troop transport. And um, you were sleeping about six deep in bunks. Got seasick out about the second day out. <laughs> so, so I missed a couple of days. <laughs> but, but after that, it was all right. So um, how was that? Being told you're going to. Hmm? Oh, how was that being told? That, hey, you're going to get on this ship and you're going to go to Korea. Oh, it was, that was an adventure. Yeah, that was that. That was okay. So um, what did what did you guys do? To, oh, go ahead. We went. We landed in I think in Kobe, Japan, and we did get some uh, time off there. You know. Uh, a couple of a day or two, and then we ended up um, landing landing in uh, Incheon, and then the fun was over. I, I could bet. So on, on the transit yeah. over from San Diego, I'm I'm guessing you guys left San Diego. What what was your day to day like for that transit to Kobe, Japan? Oh, on, on the ship? Yeah. So we, we didn't play cards, fooled around. I mean, it was, it was um, typical sea cruise, <laughs> except the food wasn't that good. Hey, um, hey the, the, Navy, the Navy knows how to treat you guys well. Yeah, they did. Yeah. So um, 
with your time that you spent in Japan, what was that like for you? Well, it was, it was um, kind of a cultural shock. Um, the Japanese people were, were um, they were nicer to us than I thought they'd be since we beat them in a war and killed so many of them. But they were, um, they weren't, they weren't, we didn't feel any hostility from them at all. So was it still, was it still, there? We weren't there that long. Was it still obviously under um, occupation? Was there a lot of U.S. presence there outside of like the guys going to Korea? Yeah, there was, um, I think the military probably controlled most of what was going on in Japan at that time. Oh, okay. And then when you guys left Kobe, you said you went to Incheon. So were you part of the invasion and the landing, or were you guys yeah. coming afterwards? We, um, they had two separate landings, and we were in the second one. And the first one had some uh, resistance, and we didn't get a whole lot. Um, I don't know whether that was, they left the, the first Marine Regiment, I think, probably didn't get as much action as the rest of them. And it had, may have something to do that I think they all knew, you know, the higher ups all knew it's all reserves. And that was hindsight. I didn't know it at the time, but I think that was the reason why we didn't get as much action as everybody else did. Oh, okay. So do you, when you were out there waiting to go ashore, were they still doing the ship to shore bombardments and were you seeing what we would see? Yeah, they, they, uh, the, the amount of, uh, the amount of firepower and offshore from the, from the Navy ships, um, air power, I mean, it was like, that was like going to be like D-Day. They put so much, you know, stuff on shore. And I don't think there was that much to, uh, when we got there, I don't think there was that much, there wasn't that much resistance. Uh, we, we thought it was, they said it was going to be a surprise. And I don't know how you think you're surprising somebody when you, when you, when you bombed them for 24 hours straight. <laughs> with everything they had. <laughs> so growing up during World War II, um, I don't know how often you got to see the newsreels, but you probably were aware of these type of ship-to-shore bombardments from the newsreels as a kid. What was it like being on the other end of that, where now you're going to be one of these guys that's about to go to shore? Uh, shore? Well, I'll tell you what truth. We were all scared to death. When, when the landing craft comes in, um, the movies we had seen as kids, when you see these landing, like the Marine Corps was doing all the landing in all the islands in the Pacific. I mean, it was sitting ducks. And I thought, man, it's our turn to be the duck. Uh, but as it turned out, in our case, it wasn't, we didn't really get that much resistance. But I'll tell you, we were scared. So, now you guys hit the shore, you hit the beach and probably very much like what you, what you would have seen back then. The ramp comes down, you guys go ashore. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and they talked, to, they talked about seawall and of course, growing up in Galveston, my concept of a seawall was not what we saw. It wasn't really a seawall like Galveston's. It was just a big rise in the land and, they, somebody had uh, made some ladders out of uh, maybe bamboo or something that were crawled up. It was, it was different than I thought it was going to be. But it wasn't as bad as I thought it was going to be. Well, that's definitely a good thing. That wasn't as bad as you thought it was going to be. So you guys uh, hit the beach. You establish your beachhead. What happens over the next few days? Well, everybody then 
uh, tries to get organized in, in the right groups and everything. And then we, you know, you get orders to move out. And of course, being a grunt, you don't know where to go, where you're going. You just tell you, they tell you where to go and you go. Follow the guy ahead of you. And the guy, you know, at that time, uh, it was good weather. I mean, it wasn't hot or cold. I think that was probably September when we landed. I don't, I can't remember what it was, but it wasn't bad weather. So now I got to ask, because my, my Navy background being a corpsman who served with the Marines, did you guys have corpsmen attached to you? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So those are, the guys, those are the guys we took care of. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Oh. And we, oh, man. We, we really respected them. So did they give they, you guys any first aid training or were you guys all reliant on, um, uh, on doc? We, no, we had, we had some, but it was, it was very limited. It was about, uh, trying to stop the flow of blood. If you something, you know, if somebody's bleeding bad, to put a tourniquet on it or, uh, uh, a bad, a big, big band, big bandage to soak up blood or something. Well, we didn't have a lot of it, but we were did, definitely relied on Corman for everything. So, I mean, it sounds like you're, you guys kind of were still doing the stuff that we taught our Marines to do, which was uh, if you're hit, self aid, then if there's a Marine around you, buddy aid, then get to us to do the major treatments. Yeah. One of the, one of the things I disagreed with. They said uh, when we were landing, if, if somebody's down, leave them. <laughs> hey, I ain't leaving anybody. I, mean, I don't want them leaving me. Yeah. No, that's. <laughs> but it, it, it didn't have. It didn't happen. But yeah, they were trying to, you know, make sure you get ashore. And if somebody's down, don't wait. Don't try to pick them up. Just go. Keep going. But, yeah, that's a that's yeah. a hard choice to make. I don't think anybody, I don't think anybody listened to him. Yeah, I I would hope no one did. I, I understand why they say that, but it's it's not a real choice to make. Well, it would be. I guess, it would be. Realistically, it would be because you needed to get to shore. You know, you get to right. set up an establishment on shore where you're safe, and can fight. But, and then, by the, by the if you get that established, then somebody can go back and pick up somebody that's wounded. Right. But that, that that doesn't happen in real life. No. So that now, guy's your buddy. Oh, go ahead. No, I said that guy's your buddy. Oh yeah. You've been yeah. through, you know, sort of training and everything. You, you made a friend. You ain't, you're, not, you're not leaving your friend laying there to pool. No, not at Whatever. all. So now you, um, you guys got your beachhead going and you finally start moving out. The way that it was always described to me, and I looked it up last night, I didn't realize how far from the beachhead to where the Chosen Reservoir was, that it was quite a distance away. Oh, it was, uh, oh. <sighs> maybe. 50 to 100 miles. That's a long way. It wasn't anywhere near there. Yeah, I, I guess it took, I'm us just... long, it took us a couple of months. I don't think we got to, I don't think we got to there until about the middle of November. That's much over. It was a couple of months to get there. And we, you know, we were in, um, off and on, you're in, in fighting. And with some combat. Um, I don't think, uh, for some reason, I don't think they. I think they kept this uh, in reserve a lot of time. I didn't really see a lot of combat between there, but it was some. And it was sporadic. Do Do you remember your first um, engagement? 
Oh yeah, yeah. And it was, <laughs> we were, you know, we, we were told to dig in, of course, and come nightfall, we're gonna dig in. And we were in a place where you couldn't dig. <laughs> More rock than soil. And I'm like, man, I'm not, I'm not gonna get very deep here. But, uh -huh. you know, we try to find a location to dig in, but some of it was kind of useless. So how did, how did that night go then? It was, um, it was, it was scary for when you, you know, you don't know, you have no idea what's going to happen. So it's, it's kind of frightening. You see a lot of stuff at night. It's not even there. Yeah. I, I know exactly what you're talking about. Did you, were you guys um, on this first engagement? Were you guys on patrol or were you guys ambushed? Did they come looking for you or did you guys find them? No, we were, we were, we were moving forward. Um, we were headed north, I guess, north. And uh, we engaged, we engaged them. Uh, they were, um, they were entrenched, I guess you'd call it, but we had, um, we had good air support as long as, as long as the weather was good, we had air support and made it made all the difference in the world. Um, the, those guys, those guys flying, uh, mostly flying, uh, P-51s, but uh, Corsairs also, and uh, we liked, uh, and the, as it turns out, we liked the Corsairs better because they could stay over the target longer, but, oh, okay. you know, they were a little bit slower and could make a quicker loop around, but it, the, the uh, napalm that they would use and the, uh, uh, the firepower they had, it was, it, uh, it was so much, if they would have had the same firepower in the air against us, it would have been, it would have been bad. Probably would have beat us. Oh, really? So at, at this point in time, um, when you get into this first engagement, obviously it went well in general. You're, you're still talking to us. What was, oh, yeah. <laughs> what was the, um, what was your mind like afterwards, after all the fighting died down and, and that evening or that morning? Well, it, it um, we were kind of excited about it in a way. Uh, I guess it's kind of like a kid riding a, a joy ride at a, at a fair or something, and you, you live through it. And you thought, man, that was, that was something. We did a lot of talking amongst ourselves afterwards that we're kind of happy to be alive. And then it, um, uh, some of the guys, so a few people got, were wounded. Um, uh, a couple of guys, not too many people got killed. Thank goodness. But, um, you got, it, it was kind of like, you, you, you live through it and you think, you know, we can, you know we're gonna make it, we can, we, can, we can win this. Up until that time, you were more, more scared than anything else. I mean, we were, you know, we, we were just, uh, we didn't think of ourselves as being 19 years old or something, you know, you think, I'm a big guy. I'm, tough guy now but underneath you knew that you were just a, just a guy right. you were, you're not really a, a combat soldier or anything but so did you have any um uh, any veterans with you guys from world war ii or who had been in five or six years longer than you it was there was um uh, I knew of only one guy that was a, a sergeant who had been in for a long time and he stayed a sergeant because he kept getting busted. 
he's an alcoholic. But well, but he did have he did have combat time. He did know what he was, you know. He knew the right things to say to uh, keep us calm and motiv motivated. He was he was from Crockett, Texas. <laughs> nice. So was was the majority of your unit uh, from Texas then? Yeah, um, well, I had some, quite a few from Louisiana. Um, uh, most of them were from Texas. Most of them were all um, the reserves from Texas. Oh, okay. So uh, during this time as you're moving through, um, going to where you're ultimately going to end up at the Chosen Reservoir, are you interacting with or coming across the civilian population? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That was. It was um, the uh, civilian population. The uh, some of them were helping us. They were carrying uh, sea rations, um, carrying a lot of stuff that saved us from carrying it. I don't think I don't don't know if they were carrying ammunition or not, but they were carrying a lot of a lot of supplies um, and there were a lot of uh, this, these guys were older they were probably 40s or 50 years old they weren't I guess they were too old to be in the army or whatever but I had the, I had the feeling that they were after, not at first but after a long time probably a, a year later I was thinking these guys doing all this work for us, but probably telling everybody on the other side where we were and what we had. So, you know, <laughs> so they, they were Koreans, even though we were fighting the other Korean. So that's what I was going to ask and, you. And this, this, this is before the Chinese ever got into it. So it was so all I was, Koreans. That, so the Koreans that you, that, uh, where you guys came in, that was... <laughs> By today's standards, North Korea, right? Like today's map, you got Pusan's in North Korea. Is it still South Korea or is it North Korea at that point in time? Uh, it's um, it's right at it's right at the thirty eighth parallel. Uh, it may have been. I think it's north of the thirty eighth parallel. Okay, J just just for reference. In China, I think it is it's on the west coast. Okay. So yeah. how you said it took you a couple months to get to the reservoir. Yeah. When you guys finally got there, like you said, I think you said it was mid to late uh, November. And you had mentioned earlier that the weather was not bad when you guys landed. No, uh -uh. it wasn't bad at all. No, it was, it was, some still summertime. Um, it got cooler at night, but it was night. It was okay. Um, it didn't get cold. Of course, every the further north we went, the, the cooler it got, and it, it also I think the altitude was everything. Thing was seemed like everything you did was uphill. <laughs> That's like every, not a good thing. Every seemed like every battle we got into in the in the daytime was uphill which wasn't any fun so prior to getting to the reservoir were you guys um getting resupplied with uh cold weather gear or anything because i know the name for a lot of you is the frozen chosen yeah we got uh, we got what well, he brought up it's amazing how much stuff they had over there of the trucks, tanks, artillery. I mean, it, it's amazing how much how much they had over there. It's, um, they had tanks. They had tanks with uh, a blade on the front of it, like a bulldozer, to make roads to make uh, kind of make roads. And I don't know if they did that because of the the snow, or they may have had it before that. So, anyway, so it was, 
stuff we saw was so kind of surprising. So speaking of um, snow and um, road building, did you guys work with the CBs at all? Were they, were they out there doing construction and building roads or airfields that you saw? Yeah, they built, um, I remember they built an airfield at one time. And I think, I'm trying to think when that was. Um, I know they were working on the airfield, but I don't know who was building it, whether it was the CBs or not. Who should, by the way, be the second favorite Navy the people. Army was it Navy people doing it? Uh, I, I don't know I, for I, sure. I assumed, it, I, thought, I assumed it was engineers building it. Was, yeah. you know, you just, oh. I didn't know the CBs were building anything. I'm not 100% sure. That's why I was, I was curious if you had run it into it. Yeah, yeah we, nobody tells us anything. <laughs> but the, <laughs> with, the, with the land. The, the new thing is, corpsmen are your favorite for the Marines, and the second favorite Navy people are, are the CBs because they build you guys uh, good barracks. <laughs> <laughs> so when you finally got up to the reservoir and Little did you know at the time that this would become some epic battlefield that the Marines still talk about today. What was your impression of the place that you guys were supposed to hold? What the hell are we doing here? I mean, it's, you know, if you're going to win a war, you should win something. You, you know, if somebody gave you that whole area of the world, you wouldn't take it. I mean, if, if it's not, it's a nothing. It's a big zero. And, they, and everybody would say, you know, what the hell are we doing here? You just, you just keep fighting and fighting and fighting and pushing people back until you finally get where you're going. And when you get where you're going, you think, why am I here? This is stupid. I never, I, and I still don't know why they did it. So was there any value to that land other than a big reservoir? Well, they, well, they wouldn't for the people who live there. They, uh, uh, I suppose they made a reservoir for it. Well, anybody makes a reservoir so you'd have water supply. And I think that was a man-made thing anyway, like most of them are. Yeah. Uh, but what, what, what do we want with it? By the time we got there, it was solid ice anyway. Nobody's drinking that water. So now that we've reached that, so you're up there. It is now no longer warm. <laughs> it is now from oh, it got it, and it just uh, it happened that quick. It was it was cool. It had gotten cold because of the time of the year, but then it got ridiculous. It just uh, it got what I told everybody was 60 below. And uh, when I, I thought about that later on, I think I wonder if I'm lying. <laughs> so I went and looked it up on a computer and it gets to be 70 below. So I may have been telling the truth in that case. And then I've seen um, stories about it was 50, 50, 55 below. Well, you can't tell the difference between 10 below and 40 below. It's, oh, yeah. It's a point where it's out of human recognition. It's just... And then some of the, some of the things that happened were, were really bad. Um, carbines wouldn't even fire. They got frozen. Um, or the, the M1 still worked. And one of the problems was um, in your bandolier where you had your extra rounds, those things would be frozen. You know, just think, God, I'll put this in there, fire, is, is it going to work or not? <laughs> Oh wow! But uh, I, uh, uh, one of the, you know you remember strange things. Yeah, uh, definitely. 
the water in your canteens are frozen. You got to go find a, a something a, something that's running, a motor that's running, so you can put your canteen by it to thaw it out so you can drink. And then you think, God damn, the water's cold. <laughs> <laughs> So now, how so, long how long were you guys up there before um, everything went bad? Uh, about about maybe two weeks. When we had uh, we had a Thanksgiving meal which I thought was a miracle. And, um, and I think the next day it was, it was, they, they overran it. They demolished us the next day. It was when the Chinese got into it. And that's when it was, that's when it got really scary. Cause you know, they, they gave us extra bandoliers of ammunition and, when you got 80, 160 rounds, you think, man, is that going to be enough? And then you wonder who the hell's got the, we had plenty of ammunition, but you didn't always know where exactly where it was. Oh, okay. Yeah. Somebody, somebody, somebody knew where it was, but we didn't know that somebody was all the time. And then you get a lot of confusion going on. So now did you guys and this may have been way above your pay grade, but was there any indication that things were about to go really bad or did they just no. go real bad immediately? It just kind of immediately. It just happened. I think, God, the hell, the hell, the hell did he come from? I mean, they, they got the same conditions we are and, and, and they were less uh, dressed preparedly than we were. I mean, they were stuff they were wearing. I don't know how they even lived. I don't know why they didn't all have frostbite immediately. Oh, really? Yeah. So they weren't. Oh, I was just going to ask. So when this happened, I know it's a really mountainy, ruggedy area. So what was, when you guys first realized something bad was happening, how far was the standoff between where our lines were and and the the Chinese and the Koreans moving on us, was it far enough away where it was a lot of uh, indirect fire at that time, or did they just kind of come out of nowhere and? It just uh, most of the time they were coming at night. Um, we had uh, we had uh, daylight to. Uh, recollect us things and get, you know, take inventory of how, you know, what we needed to do and load up and everything. But when they came, it was, it was, uh, I think their psychology that they were doing was, was helping them quite a bit. All screaming and hollering the whistles and all that BS that they did. But I also think they were on drugs or, high on something because they were very erratic. They didn't, uh, they didn't protect themselves. I mean, if the, if the, it was almost like they were on a suicide mission. Like, they were like kamikaze uh, when they came at us. So were they more acting like an insurgent force rather than a, an, you know, organized army? Forcing just throwing no, bodies. They were they were organized uh, for a long time. They were definitely organized. What whoever was planning that to come and you know to do the strike, um, and it was um, probably when we decided to get out of there. Um, I don't know whether it's because they lost so many people, but they were they were a little bit disorganized and they were like insurgents. Uh, I don't know I don't know who kept them uh, organized at all. 
compared to the, what they were at first. So if you don't mind, what was a night like um, once this kicked off for you? I Obviously, you guys were probably living in foxholes um, and snow, but what? Yeah, the, the, the weather was worse than anything. Uh, Well, I think most people were scared of freezing to death or, get, or losing toes or fingers or ears and whatever from frostbite after a while, because even if they didn't, if nobody attacked, you still had that. Right. You still, you know, that was, uh, that was a concern 24 hours a day where they were only concerned about eight hours a day. That makes sense. So did you guys have, um, like, again, going back to the corpsman, were, were they able to provide any care for you guys uh, with the frostbite? Was there a battalion surgeon out there taking you guys back and getting you guys treated? Yeah, they were always, um, there, there was always a, a, an evacuation plan to take, uh, to take people out that were wounded or or with frostbite. Um, as far as uh, whether they had any surgery, I don't know because I never, never, I was never in that with those people. Oh, I, I avoided, avoided being injured and avoided frostbite. And just happened to be very lucky, and it so, wasn't because I was a great shot or anything. It just, just a matter of luck. Yeah. No. I mean, I. I'm happy that you don't have any of the injuries or any of the, um, that you didn't lose anything physically while you were over there. <laughs> it, it was, it was a year later that I got hurt. Uh oh, it was a, a whole year later. Yes. So and now, I didn't get hurt that bad. A broken leg. Oh, well that's, that's not a good thing, but it's better than what could have happened up there. <laughs> And and where where that happened it was it was cold again, but it wasn't like it was nothing like at the reservoir. It was nothing that cold, and I'll never see that thing that cold again in my life. I mean, I'll make sure I never put in a position in the world that has that kind of temperature. Yeah, that's that that temperature. Maybe, just... maybe they don't. They might not have that temperature all the time. It may have just been a freak thing. Something come through like a hurricane comes through it might be just something like that that where it got that cold but i don't know how anybody i don't know anybody lives in that area i don't know how they live in north dakota yeah i mean i i am a big fan of cold weather but there's a certain point usually when it hits like negative 10 that it's no longer fun oh no i told my wife first wife i said I went there. He said, "It's no place to fight a war," and she said, "There isn't any place to fight a war." She has a valid point. Yeah, I thought about it. I said, "Yeah, you're right." So now this you... is the stupid. Oh, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. I'm... Um, so I'm finished. At some point in time during all this, you had mentioned earlier on your way into the reservoir area that you guys had pretty much as long as the weather was good, you had air support. Did you guys yeah. maintain that over uh, Chosen? Yeah. The air support? Um. We when you had the when the, we we didn't get air support when we had bad weather, none at all. I mean they couldn't fly, and I don't think I don't think they could see anything. And uh, we did have instances where um, where they napalmed our troops by accident Ooh. because some of them with the, not knowing exactly where we were and where they were. I guess from the air, you can't tell one one bunch from another. Um, so they, they tried not to have any air support unless they could be very accurate with what they were hitting. And we had, uh, we still had artillery from the rear that was pretty accurate. 
So what was it like? Um, what was it like going through that part of it? The artillery barrages on the enemy lines. I mean, obviously you guys weren't that far away from the impact zones. No, we were, we were usually at least a um, hundred to 200 yards away from it. We, we weren't that close to whoever's calling it in, forward observer calling that stuff in. It's, uh, they're, they're, they're pretty sure that we, we wouldn't get hit by it. Occasionally it would happen, but it wasn't because of accuracy, because of not all rounds go where they're supposed to go. Right, right. You know? So then that's a manufacturer. Yeah. Uh, I was my first Marine Corps platoon, I was with the mortar mm -hmm. platoon. And we've <laughs> seen quite a few rounds do what they were never intended to do. Yeah. So you, you were familiar with mortars. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. I liked, I liked the, I was a more, you know, mortarman. I mean, I was good at it, uh, good at setting it up. I mean, never did get to, to know how accurate I was at firing it. But uh, I liked the idea of that. If you could stay, be on one side of the mountain and knock out somebody on the other side of it. If you could uh, put the right amount of increments in there. To <laughs> yeah, those little tiny. More, more. What do you what do you what do you call the things that they add to to add distance to, the, uh, to the mortar that go on the bottom the little yeah increments yeah, yeah. that that's what we increments call them. okay yeah. yeah that's what I that's what I remembered but yeah those yeah that's that's a game, that's a get fun game to play oh yeah <laughs> uh, you know it's kind of like horseshoes and hand grenades the closest wins. Uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> That's right. So when they finally gave the order to pull back, um, how organized was that for you guys? Or was it get out of your holes and start moving back? It was, it was, um, in a way it was organized, but, uh, you know, it's, it's always organized on paper, but in <laughs> fact, it doesn't come out exactly like you want to do. But we did, of all the things we did, I thought getting out of there and getting to the coast was probably the most successful thing we did. I mean, we were successful to a point of getting to the reservoir, but we after that we got our ass whipped and get and then we just like uh, Polar said, we're going to attack in a different direction, and, and we did. And that was that was. That was a that was a fight to get out of, to get to the coast. I mean, it was it was brutal. So you said it took you about it was, two months to get there. How long did it take you guys to finally yeah. hit the coast? Uh, three three or four days. Oh wow. And we actually we got it covered about what I could, what I thought, and I've, I've looked it up since, but I still don't know exactly. It was, it was about seventy miles, I think. Um, and actually, getting there that quick was good because we were you couldn't make good time. We were, we had resistance all the way, and the we were in, in deep snow a lot of the time. We had. You try to, to uh, protect the group, the bottom, the group that's on the bottom leaving. And, and it had uh, a lot of vehicles. And I think I'm, I'm positive what they were doing was shooting the drivers. Uh, you know, because shoot the driver, it stops the convoy. And, uh, I think the guys that were driving were uh, braver than, than anybody else, really. Oh, I can imagine, especially. I think they the knew it didn't at that time. And, and that's when uh, <clears throat> it was more like insurrection of the Koreans, Koreans and 
Chinese were still involved in it. Chinese, for some reason, were still trying to stop us from getting where we were going. But they were, I think they were disorganized, but there was still plenty of them. So do you think the Chinese and the North Koreans were working as one or were they working uh, not uh, together? Uh, it, it didn't. I don't think the, uh, I don't think the North Koreans were that good. I mean, we, we, beat, we beat them, we didn't beat the Chinese. But the Chinese just overwhelmed us. You know, they, they just, just too many bodies. They just too many of them. Wow, because I, mean, I think just, I... Would have, if we if we would have stayed, if we would have stayed, I wouldn't be telling these stories. I mean, they would have annihilated us. Because I, I think I read somewhere it was over a hundred thousand Chinese that came across, if not more. Well, it was more than that. it was more than that. Oh, really? I saw it by myself. <laughs> wow. I, I, I saw them when I was sleeping. So let's talk about the days that those four days of, of pulling back. Um you guys were getting pounded for how long were you guys getting pounded for up in um, up in the actual reservoir before you fell back? Uh, well, it was it was uh, not constant, but it was close to it. Um, they kept they kept uh, bringing in. I guess they kept bringing in more people. Uh, I don't know if they bothered to ever bothered to pick up their dead. Uh, never, never saw them. Never saw them uh, try to save anybody. I think they were, it's like they were on suicide. And I think, I'd look, I thought about it afterwards, years afterwards, and I thought China, China got in there for population control just to kill all those guys off. They were all, they were all kids. They were all Teenagers, they're all very small. Really? Um, they weren't. They I don't, they weren't uh, seasoned veterans or combat. I've never I've we never just, heard anything like that. But that would make we sense. Feel, we didn't feel sorry for them, but till afterwards. But uh, you know, was, right. So as you guys are, um, yeah, I, I, go ahead, try. When, when uh, uh, one of the things that um, was surprising to me at the time was uh, when we were going to the coast, there were almost as many civilians. They, they were headed the same way with us. They were they were trying to get out of there, I guess, and they're going to save their but. I don't know what, I uh, had no idea what they'd be doing if we hadn't have been there. And, and I don't know why they were taking that opportunity to get out of there. I have no idea what was going on with the, with the civilian population of North Korea at that time. They, they I'm, probably, I'm sure they weren't, I'm sure they weren't friends with the Chinese. Right. Uh, they probably wanted to get out of there as nothing, much as you guys did. Yeah, but when and when we got to the coast, I, I, I would think they had as many people, civilians, as we had personnel. Oh wow, it's unbelievable. So now, did we help? And they got they got on the ships and went south. Okay. <laughs> they put, yeah. And I never did. Um, I never did do any study to see why they helped them or where they took them. Or we went to Pusan. I don't know. Where, I don't know where they went. So from um, <laughs> as a Marine at that time, you guys get back on the ships, like you were saying. Um, Again, probably uh, reversing the order 
now naval gunfire is trying to <laughs> send the Chinese and the Koreans back up into the hills as you guys are getting on the ships. Did you guys feel a defeat or were you guys happy that you guys made it out of there? We were, we were, I don't know, I can't speak for everybody else, but to me, I was just glad to get out of there. And we felt like, actually, you felt like you won because you got out of there. I mean, that's the way I felt. Oh, okay. That that makes a lot of sense, but I, too. At that, at that time, I thought, I'll never tell anybody what happened because we got our ass whipped. Now they're going to act like we did something good, and we really didn't. We didn't do anything good there. They talk about heroes. The heroes were the people that were cooks, drivers, corpsmen, everybody who wasn't involved in actually fighting. Those were the heroes. Uh, I mean, that's not, they, that's not what they signed up for. Well, the corpsmen did. They knew that they were going to be number one casually. We yeah, us us Carmen are a little bit um let's just say special in that way. We we kind of like to find trouble sometimes. Yeah. You gotta be nuts to be a corpsman. You gotta have a screw um, loose somewhere. I probably have the paperwork verifying that I I have quite a few <laughs> screws loose somewhere. I'm sure you do. <laughs> so um as you guys are on the ships, you you have now Little do you know what 20, 30, 40 years later, like I said earlier, will be embedded into like the Marine Corps ethos of warriors is chosen reservoir. What's the conversations like between you and your buddies? Um, I only have one. I only have one left. That was, and, and it, it, the coincidence about this particular guy, his name is Ebby Pye, P Y E. He and I were in kindergarten together. Oh, wow. Went through grade school, went through high school together, worked together at American National Insurance Company, went in the Marine Corps, would join the reserve, same time, went all the way and um, he wasn't, he wasn't on the, he wasn't with me on the ship coming back. And I thought he was, I really thought he was dead, you know, cause I hadn't seen him in, in a while. And then, uh, the next time I saw him was in the States, and I, you know, I thought, God damn, you made it. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, he's still alive. He's living. He's in a uh, retirement home in uh, somewhere around Katy, Texas. And we we stay in touch on on uh, email. I get something from him every day. But oh wow, yeah, that that is a friendship that has been through a lot. <laughs> yeah, and a coincidental thing, and. Unknowns to either one of us, we both had sons named Daryl. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, after you guys get back on board ship and you depart that area, where do you guys go next? We went to Pusan. We landed in Pusan. I think, uh, I guess there's no way to check, but I think that ship we were on, um, it was either Mayfield or Bayfield. And I think it's the same one we came over from Japan on. I'm not positive, but I think, it, you know, that <laughs> Navy Bail. ships all look alike to me, yeah. but I think it was the same one. I don't know if there's any way I could check on that or not. You know, there, there's probably somewhere out there where either the Navy or someone with a lot of time on their hands has a whole <laughs> list of every ship that was at uh, evacuating people from Chosen Reservoir and who sent people up to Incheon for the landing. It was a, it was, there was a lot of ships there to take us back. Well, I guess I should ask. So 
the pictures I have seen, it looks like you kind of, kind of came out of a of a valley and then out and you saw you would be looking out to the ocean. When you guys came out, did what was the feeling like seeing all the Navy ships out there probably laying down gunfire? It was, uh, it was, it was a, well, it was a good sight just to be, just to see the ocean, to see the, the ocean, just to see that, to get that, you know, to, because uh, all we saw up to that time was the same old scenery. It was all white and snow and ice and crap. And to get to, uh, walk on level ground was a treat. It was, you know, it's just, God, we, we got, we, we've arrived. Uh, and you actually, um, we'd have been, we could, we could fight there better than we could where we came from. I mean, it felt like we could, even though we, we, we didn't have any more opposition there. So when you guys got down to Pusan, did they put you back out onto the lines or were you guys given I, a few bit of respite? No, we, we were, uh, we were in a rest area. Um, they put me in, um, uh, Mason and, uh, I took advantage of the, well, I could type and they put me in a, a place typing up um, purple hearts, uh, silver stars, bronze stars, letters of commendation and stuff. I, I could type, so I had that job to do. And it, uh, it kept me out of, out of combat for a long time. So how, uh, how, do, how was that? I mean, you probably read a bunch of purple heart uh, oh, God, stories yeah. from all no, the write-ups. But you know what you do when you um, you write words. You write the words that are written. Your fingers just follow the the word, and you don't absorb the the meaning of it. You don't suffer along with what you're reading. That's all. I mean, you don't. I've typed up um, probably for. I was probably there for about three months. And uh, I don't remember any of them. Don't oh, remember really? any stories because I just I just didn't uh, didn't want to see, see the misery that went into it. Right. So I, I didn't I didn't read them. I just typed them. It okay. Just work. You know. But it was um, it was a good time for me. I got uh, I got back to civilization. And um, it was um, it was January, February, March, and it was still winter time. But in Southern Korea, it was not as bad. I, I bet you anything over minus ten degrees felt like summer for you compared to up there. <laughs> it was uh, it wasn't even it wasn't even freezing there in Southern Korea. It wasn't. Um, so you, so you probably could have walked it, around with shorts. Was, <laughs> 50, 50 would have been uh, sunbathing. <laughs> yeah. So where did you go after that? Um, went back to, um, uh, there was um, a major wit who had come over on the ship with us. And a friend of mine uh, named Joe Dan Franklin from Galveston, who was a good friend of mine. He told the major that uh, he had he knew somebody who could type, and he got me transferred from where I was in uh, in Pusa and Mason to wherever he was in at that time in Korea, and I don't know exactly where it was. It wasn't a town. It was in the boonies, and uh, it was S three section. I got into S3 section and typing frag orders for everything was going on with uh, first, <laughs> the 1st Marine Regiment. And it was type orders for uh, 
searchlight, tanks, artillery, offshore, uh, air support, and they had typing up and get to the orders to everybody. And that so, was my job. So people listening to this understand a frag order is something that Fra uh, fragmentary order to what, request. Uh, it goes out to every commander of, of all of the uh, companies. Uh, and then if they don't have that order, they can't move. Right. So, you know, it's got to be something visible. You can't be something they heard on the radio. You know, you can't. So it was one of the things I had to do, which was got me, it got me out of combat. We were still in, you know, kind of a, a not too dangerous area because you wouldn't put the colonel in a dangerous area. You know, yeah. it's got to be pretty safe. Um, and the, uh, the Koreans had built a, you know, you're thinking about that. I'd like to know exactly where that was now, but I was, uh, won't be able to, well, probably won't be able to find it because it was, it might have been hills such and such number. Um, they built a log cabin with doors, windows. And I have, uh, outside of that, about 20 yards away was a bunker. It was built into the side of the hill with logs and sandbags and it was that my friend Joe Dan and I lived in for maybe two months. And that was that was a it was a whole year after chosen. And that was kind of kind of adventurous because we would we would go out on um, occasionally go out on uh, scouting, looking for, see what we could find. But the Chinese were not involved there where we were. It was Koreans, North Korean. I don't think they were involved where, where at that stage of the game. They may have been. But you think I was in S3 section, we'd know something. <laughs> But we still didn't know anything. <laughs> so you, <laughs> they, they, but we did. You you had mentioned um, earlier that you got hurt about a year after chosen. That was that was when I was with S three section where it was safe, <laughs> and we had to, we had to deliver. Uh, my friend Jodan Franklin was the major's runner. He stayed with him all the time. And he was a he he had the ability to never be lost anywhere in the world. I mean, he just it was a god gift. You couldn't get him lost. He knew exactly where he was all the time. He ended up being a, a Baptist minister. I mean, <laughs> and he and then he went back in the Air Force as a chaplain at one time. Anyway, he was. Um, he had uh, given an order to somebody that one of the captains didn't get his order. And he had to, in the middle of the night, wake me up to type up another frag order that had gotten lost. Uh, and I typed it up, got all the guys who had officers that had to sign it, had to get them out of their sleeping bags. And, and I was thinking when I was doing that, what are they going to be on my ass tomorrow morning? <laughs> waking them all up and, because it was cold then. It wasn't cold like like that was northern North Korea. And so we had to deliver the order that night and it was or it was already midnight. And the the order was we were moving out the next day. This was uh New Year's Eve thirty first of nineteen fifty one. So it was, it was a whole year past, past uh, chosen. And to, uh, we were going to take that. He had, a, he, Joe Dan said, you know, I need, you know, come with me. Because it was middle of the night. We could, got a good chance to get shot by our own people. 
and uh, I was going to go with him. So we couldn't. Uh, he said, "We can't. We're not going to be able to get there in time because they were going six o'clock in the morning. They were going to be taken off, and he had to get that order to them for that commander to be tell his troops to be ready to go at six in the morning." So, he said, let's get somebody out of motor pool, and we'll get a Jeep, and we'll drive there. It was, I don't know how many miles it was, but the footing was not good because it was still snow and ice everywhere. So we get the Jeep, and it's, we don't, you don't have roads, you know, you, it's uneven, and we're sliding off and ice and stuff, and so. And so I told the guy, turn the lights on so we can see where we're going. He said, you're going to get us all killed. I said, no, by the, you know, by the time they say, you know, they spot you as some forward observer, somebody sees you, and they got to, they got to wake up and get their mortars out and get them lined up. I said, we'll be, we'll be back before then. So we'd go to where we needed to go. Franklin knew where we needed to go, and he, he goes up the, up the hill to deliver the order. And... Uh, in the meantime, the mortar gunner <laughs> decides to drop a few rounds in on us because he saw they saw the light, and uh, we're we're just getting ready to leave, and it comes some rounds in, and we dive for cover. I dive for cover, and I, when I was diving, there wasn't anything; it was space, <laughs> and so I went down, went down the side of the mountain, and I'm thinking. I mean, while I'm in the air, you do a lot of thinking. I'm thinking, how far down is this before I hit something? <laughs> Think if you go too far, you're not going to make it. But it wasn't that far. And, I, and all I did was, was uh, break a leg. And it just broke the fibula, the tip end of the fibula off. And, and I, we go back and go back. And he put me in the aid station, and the guy gives me a shot of morphine, and I Slow it off. <laughs> I thought, man, you know, one of the people gets hooked on this stuff. Oh, I yeah. went off and warmed up and went off in a, in a dream. And when I woke up in the morning, everybody's gone. And I'm in the aid station and they treat me for a sprained ankle for, <laughs> for about a week. And they decide that's not it. And they put me on, uh, got to ride on a helicopter out to the ship, the Constellation, the ship that was offshore. And I stayed on there for a couple of, probably a couple of weeks. And they they set it, casted it, and then they x-rayed it uh, uh, probably a week later, and it wasn't, wasn't set. So they sent me to Japan, to Yokosuka Naval Hospital. And the guy did the he did an open, what they call open reduction, and put a pin in it. And the guy that did it was from UTMB in Galveston. <laughs> so, so. There is Texans everywhere. So, so, man, that's that's nice to get treated, hometown boy. So, um, and then I, I just stayed in Japan and for the in Kuska Naval Hospital for. I uh, was uh, I probably got there and about the third week in January, and then I, I stayed there until I got discharged in April. So now, so dur during all of this, I'm always <laughs> curious about this, during all of this, we didn't really touch about on it when you left for boot camp, but were you in contact with your family via letters? and? Yeah. You know? Oh, yeah. I wrote, uh, I had a, a bunch of people that I wrote to, and it went... <laughs> When I was in um, in Mason and had access to typewriter, I was writing typewriting letters home, and I had I can't remember. I think it was thirty one people that I wrote to, and uh, so I got mail wow. all the time. I just and, and catch hell from your buddies because you're getting all the mail and mail call. Yell <laughs> so, rogue, yell rogue, yell rogue. <laughs> so so of those and, of those thirty one pieces. Of yeah. those 31 and I, people you and wrote, how many of them were you know, uh, girlfriends? When you, when you write somebody and you're in the military and you write somebody, they write back. Yeah. You know, 
They really do. They write back. They, none, of them, none of them snub you. Uh, later on in college, when I got back in, we were in college after that, and a friend of mine from Galveston, who was one of my best friends, he was um, talking to some of the girls that I had written to, and, and they were talking to him while I was still in the middle, they talked to him about poor Charlie. He's over there in Korea. And then he said, afterwards, he said, and he writes to these girls, he's in a foxhole and he's being surrounded by the enemy and it, it's almost going to get killed, except it's all on typewritten paper. <laughs> 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 and they believe all that shit that he wrote. <laughs> oh, good times. So when you came home, how was your homecoming? It wasn't any. <laughs> no, there wasn't any homecoming really. The um, I drove. I bought a car in California when I got out and drove home. And I actually, because of the distance, because I drove it nonstop, which was you get punches after a while. You you don't really know where the hell you are. I stopped in Houston at a guy's house, a family's house that I lived with when I was in college, first year in college. And I stopped there and spent the, spent the night there and drove home the next day. Um, it was nothing. It was, you know, it wasn't, any, wasn't anything. My parents, of course, were happy to see me, but we, did, we didn't do any kind of celebration with any parties or anything. So what about your brother who was a Marine during World War II? Did you guys have a bond or anything between you that grew maybe bigger because of the combat experience? No, I don't think so. I mean, we were, you know, we were already buddies. You know. Couldn't get any stronger. I mean. Yeah. Well, I, I know things but, like PTSD and, and that and just having someone to talk to. Uh, about what you went through um, wasn't as much out in the forefront as it is now with veterans. No. Um, we, weren't, we weren't treated like Vietnamese people, guys were treated. Nobody was mad at us. Nobody spit at us. Nobody ridiculed us or anything. We weren't baby killers or anything like that. It was kind of kind of nothing. I mean, everybody was happy to see you, but nobody was mad because you went off to the military and that's, you know, killed somebody, somebody else's children. Um, it was, I don't know. It was, I, I did, um, I did block out a lot. Uh, uh, I didn't have any, any uh, PTSD or I didn't have any, I didn't have any problem with that. Some people told me afterwards I did, but I never believed them. Uh, so now, back then, was going to the VA a thing, or did you just go back to college and back to work? I went. Uh, I got home uh, April, and uh, I went back. Went back. To work at American National for till school started in September. Um, I got um, I probably got probably got better welcome back at the University of St. Thomas than I did in Galveston. Uh, really? The uh, because a lot of the there was a lot of guys at uh, University of St. Thomas in the Marine Corps at the same time. I think it was Charlie Landrum or uh, uh, Alma Lonson. It was quite a few of them, and, and they were all went in the same time we did. Wow. Melanson was one of them I saw in Korea. I'm walking down the we're walking down the road, and you know a group moving through another group of Marines and, and I hear this guy holler, kill a room. I'm thinking, who the hell knows me? And I turn around and look at it's Alonso. 
and and of course we got beards and everything and we're scruffy looking and everything. I said, How do you know it was me? He said, I could tell by your walk. <laughs> 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 I didn't know I walk funny. <laughs> so I, I want to jump ahead a little bit. So as a guy who is obviously a thinker, and even back then, like you said earlier, like trying to wrap your head around why you guys were at the Rose War to begin with, as Vietnam started, what was your take on that? I was pissed. I was, I was really pissed, thinking, you people are so stupid. You didn't learn anything from being in Korea where we didn't, we didn't win. We got a tie, maybe. Um, it's, I mean, nothing, it's still the same over there now. Still got 38 parallel and somebody on each side. Stupid. I thought, in Vietnam, I thought, God, why are you doing that? They could have. And they could have won that. They didn't, but they didn't want to, didn't plan to, which is really bad. Yeah. It's bad enough to fight a war that you'd want to win, like World War II. And I say we won that, and we did win it, but the ones who benefited was uh, Japan. Japan became great. Because of what we did for them. No, I, yeah, we there's, did. yeah, they, they came pretty close to economically taking over the war after they failed militarily. That's right. They did. They came out, they came out ahead. Yeah. I mean, I, I guess it's kind of fair with two nuclear bombs uh, blowing up cities that they can come out a little bit ahead. Yeah. So Vietnam was, kind of affected you then i take did you have kids by that time it uh my my brother who was um in the marine air wing he he was in he was in vietnam and he participated in that even though on paper they didn't um he got he got um he had he's the oldest the distinction of being the oldest guy to ever punch out of a jet because the jet went down, he had a bailout. And um, he kind of, they jettisoned, they didn't have time to jettison a canopy. He and the pilot, they went through the canopy and he ended up with a, a broken neck. It didn't, I mean, it didn't face him that much because he could still play golf. But um, he got a lot of, uh, disability you know from that happening but he never got the purple heart really and he never got the purple heart because on paper the marine the marine air wing wasn't there <laughs> that's a true story oh, you gotta love the marine corps <laughs> i didn't i didn't get purple heart either getting my leg broken in korea oh no <laughs> and, and he said my brother said well they don't want to give the killers anything <laughs> 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 they just, they just want to take from you guys. I, I, I care until until I realized that I got free license plates, and I cared. Yeah, that makes <laughs> sense. So that's when he cared. <laughs> so so now jumping way ahead. Um, obviously, after Vietnam, we had Grenada, Panama, Desert Storm, Kosovo, all of which were very short very direct um but then september 11th happened yeah do you that remember was, it? That was real yeah do, that was that was that's a shocker yeah do you remember it clearly oh yeah yeah i was i was that was the first time they hit our soil. That's the first time they brought the battle to the United States. Yeah. What did you think? That, that was a time when you, and, and you uh, couldn't prove who did it, so you didn't know who to retaliate against. Right. Yeah. So if, if, if I thought 
if I was president and I knew who did it, I would have annihilated the country. Yeah. You want to play those games? Yeah. We do the same thing we did to Japan, but that's how, and what they did to Japan is the way you should fight a war now. Don't put people in it. Don't put soldiers over there. Just annihilate them. And you quit. We don't. We don't want to play this game. Yeah, I, I, sadly, I agree with you on that. That um, it's brutal. Yeah. And you take out a lot of civilians, but it gets the message across and it's all over. Yes. So were you surprised to see us now 21 years or 20 years later still fighting these wars? Yes. Yeah. But, and through all the years, we've never gotten any smarter. Look at the way the country's being run now. That's it. We just keep getting dumber and dumber. I, yeah. Um, we've become far more tribal and far more teamy than I think any time in our history. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, you wonder how that can happen. You really do. Yeah. So speaking of, of tribal and teamy, um, when I met you, you came out to the Combat Wounded Veterans Challenge. Are, do you stay active with veterans of today? No, I really don't. That's, you know, the thing I did out there, um, I was introduced to that by Gerard Coleman. Um, otherwise, I, would have, I wouldn't know anything about it. I'm for it, you know, 100% for it. And whatever we can do, you know, for for veterans, um, what's going on with the veterans? Uh, you see homeless ones? Yeah. Should never. Well, there shouldn't be anybody homeless, really. I mean, all the money that's wasted on foreign aid. Uh, yeah. Just, but, you know, that... We're not, and you're talking about money that's wasted, uh, the money that, that would take care of all the veterans and all their families and have them, you know, build them a place, let them all live together. They're not going to live forever, you know. They'll die off and you, uh, it'll be the end of it. But it's not like something that's going to go on forever. Right. And hopefully we stop making Take care of these guys. Yeah. And the ones the ones who are uh, screw themselves up so mentally from what happened to them, they're not going to recover. You know, some will, but most won't. Like they need to take care of them. So, Charlie, if you could tell, if you could talk to some uh, Marines of today, what would you tell them about? or not even Marines of today yet, but kids going into the Marine Corps today, what would you tell them from your experience? Enjoy life. Whatever you got to do to enjoy life. You, you have to, uh, you know, if that's your career, you have to play the game. But you still have to enjoy life. Definitely. So look, hopefully look, you know, take somebody else's, but you still got to enjoy life. So looking back on your time in, what was your favorite time? Um, the, the favorite time was when I was in the South Korea in, in Mason. Typing, you know, it's, it's a no brainer. It was, and it was peaceful. Uh, there wasn't, there wasn't any danger there at all. There's more danger in Galveston right now than there was in there at that time. Um, we had, we had, uh, we had a lot of personnel there. 
military personnel. And we probably, we probably outnumbered the, the civilian population of Mason with the number of people we had. And it was all, um, all the people who were behind the fighting forces. For everybody, every guy you got in combat, you got three of them behind it. They are doing everything, you know, supplies and maintenance and whatever, transportation. Well, Charlie, thank you so much for sharing this story. It means a lot to me. Thank you. I appreciate it. I'm glad. And now I guess I'll, I will see you this September. I think Are so. I think I'm going to be out there. I'm 99% sure. Okay, good. Looking forward to it. Why, thank you. Take care. Take All care. Right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop the recording right now.